It's a sad story, and but it's it, 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 it's um it's uh, uh but um uh, Rich Schaefer, a uh, longtime member of our church, passed on to the Lord uh, this uh, past Thursday. It was very uh, 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 unexpected, but um, with his health issue, and he's with the Lord now. So you know the family and uh, um, the wife's Cindy Lou. And you just uh, pray for the family, two sons and their whole family uh, throughout this time of grieving. So I just want to let, uh, want you to know that. And, um, and we will celebrate together uh, Holy Communion today. And we'll starting a new sermon series, 24 Hour Change the World today. And now uh, would you rise and join call to worship? the new Passover meal and celebrate the new covenant Jesus made. We give thanks to Jesus for his body and blood for us. We'll sing Hosanna to our Messiah. Let all who follow Christ sing God's praise. Let the whole world rejoice and be glad in Jesus. Hosanna, let every knee bend before Jesus. Let every tongue welcome Christ's reign. Hosanna. Our opening hymn this morning, My Savior's Love, number 348. Maker of heavens and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. And now with you, join with me in the sharing of the peace of Christ. Please be seated. At this time, I'm expecting uh, Lynn Crum. It's Lynn Crum. I don't see Lynn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Here she is. <laughs> she will share uh, the uh, Sunday School project. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lynn Crump, and myself and Rochelle Amadio teach the first grade through the sixth grade Sunday school class. And we have started a project. It's a Bible verse memorization project plus a missionary project all rolled into one thing. Um, each Sunday, the children have a, a Bible verse that goes along with their Sunday school lesson that they have to memorize for the next Sunday. And for every verse that they memorize, they earn a small plastic gold coin that goes into their treasure box, and each coin is worth 50 cents. And they have to memorize this verse two weeks in a row. Okay, So in other words, they get to memorize two verses at a time, so they can earn up to a dollar every day, every Sunday. And they've decided to use the coins to buy an animal from World, World Vision and send to a third world country to a family in need. And the animals range in price from every, anything from $19 for a rabbit to up to $650 for a cow. And they set a goal for $96, and that will buy three ducks and a goat for a family in need. And the children would like you to help in this project by either donating a sum of money in your offering envelope, and if you want to do that on the line that says other, just mark it with Sunday School Mission, okay, and the amount that you want to give, and that will go right straight to the mission project. Or at the end of May, when the project is completed, you can match the funds that the children have earned by matching the funds that they have earned with their memory verses, and together that money will be put together to buy the animals for the families. Okay, any questions? <laughs> I know that was kind of confusing. But we started this project at the end of February, or yeah, the beginning of February we started. So it goes from February into the last Sunday of May, and at that time then we would total up how much money the kids have, have earned we're also going to get the kids are going to trade in their coins at the end of at the end of May in our little store that we're going to have for little prizes that they can earn for their coins besides the money they're going to for the missionary project. So it's it's a double fun thing for them to do. And that is Thank you, You're welcome. <clears throat> and they plan to do continually they doing it uh, spring and fall. So um and you just don't never uh, underestimate our ch uh, Sunday school children. They're very passionately uh, memorizing the verses, so they need a lot of sponsors. And um, maybe they can buy a cow uh, one day. 
now let us sing a hymn of praise, a song called um, Amazing Love. It will be on the screen. I'm forgiven. morning is Luke 22, 1 to 23, and can be found in your pew Bible on page 1636. <coughs> now the feast of the unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, calling Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. 
Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and, his, uh, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is my new covenant in my blood, which he poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man that who betrays him. This began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. And uh, today I'm going to start a new sermon series I, I share with you. And before I go on, uh, I want to pay attention uh, to the screen and the video I'd like to sh uh, sh show you. talking about Lord's Supper, and we will celebrate uh, Holy Communion today. And this series, the book called 24 Hours That Changed the World, uh, is talking about the last 24 hours hour of Jesus Christ here on earth before he crucified. And I was always wondering, the 24 hours start Thursday evening, but um, I was always wondering, how come so popular, so, uh, so uh, powerful uh, figure, that time of Jesus, and then uh, in, in, in five days, he, he was executed? And why, what happened within that five days? And Jesus came into Jerusalem the Sunday before. And then it was such a great thing as we celebrate Palm Sunday. That's how they welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. They, uh, they take up the, their clothes and uh, cloths and uh, spread over the you know, uh, uh, road. As Jesus coming in, they uh, spread their you know, palm tree um, and they welcomed him. Then Hosanna, the one who's coming in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And basically they were saying, save us, Lord, save, deliver us. 
And people of Israel, 2,000 years ago, they were sick and tired of being oppressed by so many powerful nations around. I mean, you name all those you know, empire, like Assyrian, Persian, uh, uh, Greek empire, uh, Egyptian empire, and Roman empire, one after another, they all tried to occupy this land, small land of Judea. So they were always occupied by some powerful nations. And such a horrible thing. My country occupied by Japanese for 60 years. And we remember, still remember, they still educate how hard she was. It's not nice to be occupied by someone else. And they treat you like a slave. And there's no freedom. And uh, one of the examples is the Roman Empire. Average 3,000 Jewish people crucified. On top of all those arrests and torture and all the um, imprisonment, 3,000 people average every year Roman soldiers execute Jewish people, whoever doesn't listen to their rule. So Jewish people waited, waited, waited. All these prophecies in the Old Testament, it all talks about Messiah, the anointed one, who will rescue us, deliver us, and they thought this man from Nazareth is the one. And he said that he's the one. So they welcomed him so well. But then what happened? He came into Jerusalem Sunday, and then by Thursday, the, uh, the political leaders and religious leaders already plotted to kill Jesus. And, in, in, you know, I, yeah. What happened within that five days? It's obvious. If you read that gospel after Jesus entering enter, uh, Jerusalem, it's so obvious. If you were one of the political leaders or religious leaders, you, you'd be really mad. You, you, you'd be really mad at Jesus. Because he was so, so critical about you know, all these leaders in Jerusalem. And uh, the first thing he just, he just did uh, when he came to Jerusalem was he went into the temple, Jerusalem temple. And then, as you, as you know, he made a whip. He just didn't uh, uh, just yell at them or, you know, uh, or just, you know, got upset. But he get, got in there, you know, temple, and he made a whip. I think it's kind of funny, you know. And he got so upset, and then it, it's going to take a time to make a whip, isn't it? And he made a whip, and then he starts so violent. For the first time, Jesus ever being violent that time. And he cast all these uh, merchants and money changers and all these people out of temple. And he said this, Isn't it written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations, but you made it as den of robbers. Because so many pilgrims, Judaism has only one temple, not like us, so many churches, but Judaism, only one temple in Jerusalem. So wherever you live, once a year they have to come to temple. Even you live in England, you live in Spain, you got to come to Jerusalem to sacrifice. So there's a, there's a currency exchange, things happen, and you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, business going on, selling the animals. And these uh, uh, religious leaders, clergy back then, they made a fortune out of it. And then all of a sudden, Jesus did it, and then they, they, they really upset about it, of course. And then Jesus also criticized and about, uh, there's a two group of religious people, Sadducees, more the clergy that are more politically, correct, uh, politically corrupted. And the Pharisees, they're sincere, they're very eager to serve God in a sincere way, but they're, they're uh, just prideful. They think they're, they're, they're the best. And they, they always criticize, uh, criticize about other people, not, not like them. And then this is what now he talked to uh, 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 Pharisees. He said, how terrible it will be for you legal experts and Pharisees, hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs. They took beautiful on the outside, but inside they are full of dead bones and all kinds of filth. 
and he went way far. In Matthew 23, if I was one of the Pharisees or Sadducees, I would be really upset for this. Jesus said, do what the religious leaders tell you to do, but don't do as they do, for they are like the blind leading, leading the blind. It was enough for them. Jesus also talks about tax to seizure and all other issues, the destruction of Jerusalem and all these things. So absurd. It's out of, out of agenda. They, it was enough to kill Jesus. But the problem was the Passover. Passover is the biggest like, celebration. I don't know uh, American celebration. Fourth of July or uh, uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas. The biggest the celebration for them. I think they still celebrate the Passover is the, the biggest one. The Passover we know, it was go back to Exodus. When two million Jews, Hebrews, they were under slavery, Egypt, um, Egyptians. And then God brought them out of slavery by striking all the firstborn of their land. Unless they have marks of blood of the lamb on their uh, doorposts, you have to sacrifice. Maybe I was too, <laughs> too, too, too loud. <laughs> And, uh, but um, unless you sacrifice lamb to God and then put this uh, blood of lamb on the doorpost, the, death, the angel of death will strike the firstborn of your household and your livestock. That happened. And Pharaoh, as we know, let them go. And they celebrate that Passover every year to remember well, how God was wonderful for them so usually they have this special Seder uh, supper on that Thursday. And yeah, Jesus said, uh, asked the, his disciple to prepare a room and, uh, um, and prepare the meal. And Jesus' disciple thought, you know, it will be just, you know, celebration meal and it will be good, you know, good time and having fun. And, but it was not. It was the last supper and it was special. Because all of a sudden, while they were eating, Jesus said to them, listen, he took the bread, went, and he gave to God, thanks to God, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had done eating, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And disciples were confused and got upset. What are you talking about? Why should we remember you? Where are you going? It was so uh, strange for them, but it is strange for us because if you read, Jesus talked about his death and his resurrection, what's going to happen, did every detail to disciples over and over. But they never understood what does he talking about? But they were upset because they followed this Jesus for three years, day and night, and then just tried to be disciple of him. And then uh, now finally they came to Jerusalem. And now we'll be the king, we'll be the, the leader of this country, and we'll reform and we will have uh, liberty uh, out of uh, uh, Roman Empire. Then all of a sudden Jesus said, I'm going somewhere. This is my body. This is my blood. Just remember me when you do this. So they were so upset. And Jesus said, one of you will betray, I mean, uh, deny me. I mean, uh, one of you will betray me. Of course, they were shocked. Who is going to betray you in this, at this moment, right? Who is going to betray you? You're going to be king. I'm going to be the prime minister or prime or something, you know, uh, the, whatever. Then who's going to betray you? And nobody said, not me, not me. But we know somebody, Judas, betrayed him. And Peter denied Jesus three times. And all the disciples deserted Jesus when Jesus was arrested. Nobody stayed with Jesus. Let, let, let me ask you this question. 
When have you been Judas? When have you been Peter or the other disciple? When have you denied Jesus or deserted him? The reality is most of us, maybe all of us, done that, been there, right? We did. We don't want to listen to Jesus when Jesus went this way. We know what the Bible says. We know what the Holy Spirit tell you to do. But we deny it. We just, uh, we don't want to listen to him. Jesus, many times, we want to handle my problem. Jesus, just, you know, step aside, you know, just listen and just see what I'm doing. I can handle this. Why would, Jesus, why would we would betray Jesus? Why are we still so confident on us, ourselves, myself? Why? Even though we know we are not that, you know, uh, uh, strong person or, you know, uh, powerful person. Why we trust ourselves so much? Because one thing, very critical thing, people forget about it. Many, many Christians, including myself, many times whenever I reject Jesus, I thought I'm still alive. We die with Jesus. We crucify with Jesus. That's what it is. That's all about what happened to you. Either you baptize or you profess your faith. That's what happened to you. You are dead. Your old self is dead. No more Claire before you encounter Jesus. No more Carol. No more Sally. No more EJ. No more DJ. Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. He doesn't joke. Paul is not the type of guy uh, making joke. And he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Not just Paul. We are all, whoever follows Jesus and accept him as a Lord and Savior, we are all same. We are all crucified. He was still alive. So he's writing a letter to Galatians. We are still alive. But Paul says, I have been crucified. Past perfect sense, right? It happened. It's a done thing. It's not going to happen. It just happened. By this time, Paul writing this letter. But we still think that we are still alive. We really can't feel I'm, a de- I'm dead. I don't know. I don't know how can I feel my death. I don't know how can I feel it. I'm still alive. I'm still so uh, uh, energized whenever I have a, a chance of sin. The temptation out there. I'm still so strong. I'm so still health, healthy. I don't know how can how can Paul say that? I've been crucified. And Jesus explained in one sentence, just one sentence. Jesus explained how we we die, how we can you know experience this you know death in the Holy Communion. I mean. You have 24 hours to live. You just have a 24 hour before you die. Somehow you know that. You have 24 hours to live. What would you do with your loved ones? I don't think you're gonna, you want to go to Las Vegas or uh, Disney World or uh, go to the cruise. You want to do something special with your loved ones. As for you, when you have something damn to do for you, you got to do something. Jesus, he has the greatest mission ever 
making disciples, all these disciples, last time I, I, uh, I shared with you, these 12 and now 11, they're all unfit. They're not really qualified being a disciple. Eventually they became, but at this point, no one ex- except uh, John and Andrew, I think, but no one seems to qualify for this job. But Jesus anyway took them as a disciple and he wanted to do something. All he did was having meal and wash their feet. Having meal. I mean, I mean, it, what is that? But in it, there's instruction how we die. Jesus, what? This is cup, but Jesus took the cup. Jesus took the bread. That's the first thing. There's a three action he did in communion. You got to take it. My body, my blood. We gotta t- what, is the, what is the body of Jesus Christ right now for you? Who is Jesus for you right now? The church. We are the body of Christ. You got to take it. I don't know how, how, how much struggle for you to take in church. I mean, how, how, how much you, you know, uh, uh, struggle for you uh, holding your membership. If you consider that as uh, you taking church. But it was not easy for me. I didn't want to go to Methodist seminary. I didn't want to be Methodist at all. But my three generation Methodist heritage, very rare in South Korea anyway. Uh, my family very proud of that. But I didn't want to. When I came here, South Korea, the Methodist is very, very passionate. They're very conservative, very, very strong in Bible and faith and prayer. But over here, people mocking us. I was, uh, I was in college in Arizona, and then I was attending, of course, Methodist church. And this church always, you know, there's a division in the parties, and they're fighting each other. And eventually, this uh, DS came and uh, shut down the church. So I uh, went, attended a Presbyterian church for a while, and my friends going, many college students there. So I attended Presbyterian. And then I, after I graduate, I want to go to apply for seminary. The, of course, Presbyterian pastor not going to write a letter for me to go to uh, 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 Methodist seminary. But anyway, the first time I wanted to go to like a evangelical seminary, maybe Presbyterian seminary. More I can get very, uh, the, the theology, whatever the lesson I, I, I really like. But my father said, it's like, a, he, he never been served a Marine, but he sounds like a Marine. Once Methodist, forever Methodist. I don't know, is there really, there's something somebody said, I, mean, I think my father said that. <laughs> yeah. That's why, that's why I, I really didn't want to go, but kind of dragged me, something, my family heritage dragged me to the Methodist Seminary. Of course, I didn't like it. What is that? What is, what is going on here? All kind of liberal theology, they, you know, put it out there. Oh, they try to, they, oh, we are balancing it. But you know what? It, I, I didn't want to hear, you know, all weird stuff. That time, I was so passionate. I wanted to go be a missionary to Mexico. And I was so passionate, uh, you know, young guy from Arizona drove all the way to Washington, D.C. was so disappointing. And then my 10, over 10 years of uh, my process being uh, ordination, it was just another political issue and, you know, cultural issue one after another and, you know, uh, racism after another. I didn't want to be. If you don't want me, I'm, I, I don't want to be. Thank you. Bye-bye, Methodist. But in the process, I felt that God calling me to this denomination. I don't know how much you like Methodist, United Methodist. I don't like it. But I love it. I got to love it. Because there's a people here. You know what? I think myself as a missionary to United Methodist Church. I'm weirdo in Methodist Conference. DJ, what is doing? 
What does he do? What is he talking about? Yeah, I'm weird though. But for the people, Methodists, because God would not desert you guys, people in Methodist church, whatever the bishop, whatever the political people are doing out there and spending money over there, I don't care. As long as I have life, I, I want to minister to be Methodist. Not, just, not what I like it, but I just surrender myself. Church is not a glamorous place. I talked to you, told you many, many times. Only 20 or 15 percent of mainline church people go to church every Sunday. Not really every Sunday, regular days. 80 percent of Christian people don't go to church. That tells you church is not an attractive place. But you got to take it. Taking means. You taking their problem, their, their shame, their guilt, and their mistake, everything. Like Jesus take you. You are not clean. You are not imperfect. But Jesus took you as a perfect child of God. Isn't it? And Jesus still claim you, every one of you, myself. The perfect child of God. That's why you are here. That's why you are able to receive this communion. That's why you are able to worship God. That's why you are able to call in his name. Jewish people, they couldn't do it unless somebody died. So Jesus died. After you take it, then you got to hold it up high. That's what Jesus did. Took the bread and took the cup and lifted it high and then blessed it. What are you blessed? When you like it, you bless. You don't like it, you don't appreciate, you don't bless it. Right? I mean, this cup, Jesus didn't want it. We know, we're going to talk about it. He was praying hard and over and over that just take this cup away from me. I don't want to take this cup. But he just took it because it was his will. It was God's will. We got to lift it up. No matter what, you like it or not, church, whatever, the, this church, Methodist church, doesn't matter. You got to take it. You got to lift it up. You got to break about it. Breaking about it, what? what why are we, we breaking about it? So other people can be invited. Other people can see this, and then they join your fellowship. We got to have a great time here. We got to have a wonderful thing happen in this organization. This church, this body of Christ, then we got to hold it. When we have that sign out there like that, you know, pancake breakfast, we got to have a magnificent pancake and sausage, right? We're going to have a really friendly people, right? That's what we prepare for those people. And so we got to lift it high. The last thing we got to do is drink it. Or we got to eat it. He said, this is my blood. This is my body. How weird is that? <laughs> How can I eat your flesh? <laughs> I don't want to eat your flesh. This is just bread, did you just? This is not your blood. This is wine or grape juice. But Jesus tried to make connection there. Unless we drink part of him. We are not become him. This is just symbolic, but that's what happened. And it's a symbolic, but we got to live like it. Once you partake of Jesus Christ, you have some of Jesus in you. That's why we celebrate this. And Jesus said, as often as you drink it, you eat, break it. Remember me. What a such a great thing. People don't, don't remember things. But you eat meal every day, unless you are fasting for Lent right now. You eat breakfast, lunch, dinner. You don't skip, right? You don't want to skip, right? Every meal is a holy meal. Think about it. Anytime you eat meal, you got to remember. 
Oh, yeah. I died. And this is the, the nutrition we are desire. This is, by this, we are growing up. Many Christian members, church members, think their membership holding the cup and lifting and drink it, but it's not. We know that it's not. Because Holy Communion is all about become oneness. It's one. We become one with the Christ. You, we become with one each other. I mean, do you really want that? I mean, unless you really serve people, unless you really take their problem, unless you want to be part of their issue, I mean, it really makes sense? No, it doesn't make sense. You don't care about people, not even our membership people, but people out there in the world, people in Africa, people wherever. 26,000 people starve to die every day, women and children. Just one fact. They die from preventable disease every day, 26,000 children every day. This is a fact. This is the reality we live. This is the reality we live. Unless we do something, unless we do something, how can we say, we are one and take this body of Christ and call ourselves as a partaker of his body. Jesus died, just died for everybody, not just you, not just rich people, the poor people, people in Chester, people in homeless, anywhere, prostitute, drug addict, whoever. But people don't care. Church don't care. It's all about money. I mean, are we going to sit here and then just con condemn and criticize about, criticize about United Methodist Church? No, I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to waste my time for that. I'm going to minister to people with you. I'm going to serve even just one person. We're going to make this person whole, complete, by our love. Sisters and brothers of Christ, let us remember, Jesus died for all. And that means Jesus removed all the obstacles that you can get to close to God. You are with God. He's in you. And now what? Jesus saying, can you drink this cup? That I'm going to drink this, but can you drink this cup? It was not an option. It was not just a question. Unless you drink it, you and I have no relationship. So we got to remember, when you take communion today, you got to remember, think about it. But don't think about world evangelism, but think about yourself and your loved ones. And we got to say, yes, Jesus, I'll drink it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your amazing love in your death, in your resurrection. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit always with us and guide us. Thank you for your message through the Bible, through the worship, through our devotion. Lord, we just thank you for everything. But then let us brag about it. Let us share this gospel, this good news, this great news with the people around us. Not just don't be ashamed of, of you, your name, the eternal life. Let this church know what we're one body, and we're one 
as we are one. Let us feel the pain on another part of this body. Let us feel, be there with their sorrowful time, be there with their difficult time, and take their responsibility or whatever the hardship they're going through. And fill us, restore us, and make us be joyful. Make us to praise you. And we worship here by your name. And let us serve the people in this community. And your word go beyond out of over this words of our church. And the people listen to your words and your, they feel your love through our ministries, through our life. So continue to bless each one of us. And we'd like to ask you, these people in our prayer, in need of healing, we pray for Mike Beck, Debbie and De- Dave and Debbie, and Joe and Veronica. And we will also pray the family and friends of Rich Schaefer. Such a, just such a shock that they received this. They had to embrace this fact, their loved one, loved father, beloved father and husband passed. But we know he is with you. So encourage each one of them and let them be sorrowful and let them be engraven. But they find hope and peace and comfort from you, Lord. And they can get closer and closer to you through all this. And we also pray for Charles. He's in the hospital. Be with him. Continue strengthening his body and soul and encourage him. And we pr- pray for Mala. Continue recovering from her surgery. Continue to fill her with your joy, confidence in healing, and your love. And bless all her family. We thank you for this church. Thank you for our nation. Thank you for our denomination. Thank you for your Church, continue to serve no matter what the world talks about us. Because we have just one thing in our mind, making disciple of you, Jesus Christ. And use Norwood Method Church continually. And each one of us being a missionary to wherever you appointed to us. Continue to bless our each ministries and especially Sunday schools. And bless each children that are growing up with your words and your wisdom and the vision and dream that you've given to them. Be important people for our nation and the world. And we pray. And now we continue to pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespasses against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to share with you a couple of announcements that... Um, uh, we are looking for a new choir members. Um, and if you're interested in the, join the choir, please um, talk to uh, 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 Pat Beckett in the church office for now. And also, I want to share with you that uh, uh, the trustee, deso- I mean, they made a decision to uh, uh, no uh, drinks. Uh, water is okay, but uh, any coffee or any other type of drinks uh, into the sanctuary because uh, we, we invest a lot of money for the, the cushion and carpet recently. So uh, please uh, be aware of that. 
And we have a two uh, uh, the fundraising dinner coming, uh, roast beef dinner coming April 5th, and um, I'm sorry, just one fundraising dinner, and more coming later. But women's breakfast coming this Saturday. So all the women are invited to the uh, women's breakfast this Saturday, and please join them. And now let us uh, continue worship with the offering and tithe. Holy God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And as he gave everything he has for us, and now we return, and this is what we give to you and your ministry. Bless over it, and bless all the people through this offering. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Like I said, we are celebrating Holy Communion today. And please join me in prayer. Father God, creator of heaven and earth, you brought all things into being and called them good. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on the cross, for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, deliver us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts. But during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with the Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gift of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the word the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one, min one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Like I said, this is Lord's table. This is not Norwood's table, the members only table. This is Lord's table. Whoever willing to start the relationship with Jesus, who would like to renew their relationship with Jesus, everyone welcome to this table. And today we will celebrate as you, usher Scott, uh, uh, direct you, the group of people uh, lining around this um, uh, communion rail, either kneel or you can stand and you take both elements and you can take it. And then you can go back to uh, um, your uh, pew uh, by uh, direction of uh, ushers. So now please come as you are. Serve from there. And you serve the cups. Sisters and brothers in Christ, as you feel the texture of the bread and the, the, as you drink the grape juice, remember that you are being part of Jesus Christ. And then we are all here, one body. And share this message with the people in the world as you go. Now go in peace.
we see this Holy Communion, remember who you are in Christ. You are a new creation in Him. There's no sin for you or the world. Now go in peace. Amen. brothers in Christ, you are partaker of Jesus' body, and Jesus died for all the world, and we are partaking of the problem of this world and problem of this community. So let us be true partaker of Jesus' body as we serve them and help them, and we pray in them, and now we, as you, you go in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, so that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now please stand and join me. The, the closing hymn, Nothing But the Blood, will sing the verse 1 and 4.
family of God, now go in peace into the world. May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and love of our Father in heaven and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now on forever and ever. Amen.